I think that we're going to sit here in a year or two from now and the whole list of things that make a marketing engine work is going to have changed. This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast, which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Welcome back to the Safari. Today, we have Amanda Baldwin, the president of Supergoop, who is with us today. And I, I have to say that it's been um, a long time coming and I'm thrilled that she and I were able to find some time to talk because really she is emblematic of what we talk about a lot here on the safari, which is the threading of the left and the right brain and finding people who really have had an interesting track. Uh, and in this case, uh, Amanda had a finance background, Goldman Sachs uh, and, and Apex partners, then going into marketing roles at Clinique and Dior and Strivectin, and now ending up as the president of Supergoop, probably the world's most important and famous SPF brand. I mean, literally, it's an SPF brand. That's what they lead with. Um, and not only am I and my whole family avid uh, followers of the brand and, and users of it, um, but huge fan as well of Amanda and everything she's done. And I must say that in her short four years of being the president of Supergroup, the business has grown 10 times. So she really is someone that you should be listening to. Let's get started. Amanda, how are you? So good to see you. Great to be here. Well, it's really cool to, to, to do this, even though still virtually, it's hard to believe that we I are know. all, even though you are in the office too, which is, which is good to see. Are you, the, are you also the only person in your I office? I am the only person. Once in a while I get a visitor, um, which makes me very excited, um, but it's mostly just me. <laughs> yeah, well, we can see each other, Amanda and I, through, through the wonders of technology. And as she can see behind me, there's crickets. So, but it is Friday. So, so there we go. Um, Amanda, um, thanks for doing this. Um, do me a favor. And just kick us off by giving you know a one minute background of of your of your uh, your path to the president of Supergroup. I did a little bit in the introduction earlier, uh, but tell us why your passion for beauty uh, is what it is, and how you landed in your seat. You know, I, I think the place to start is I've always been a lover of brands and brand storytelling. I I remember growing up in in New York, and since this is the retail safari, um, you know, I would walk around. New York City and wonder why one store was doing better than another. Um, and I think I was probably eight or nine years old when I thought about that. And the first job I ever wanted was to be in charge of window displays. Um, and I think because that was that was marketing and I didn't even really know what, what that meant. Uh, and so everything I've done has always come from a place of, of loving brands. Um, I, I fell in love um, with thinking about marketing strategy actually in college. Um, and decided to go to Wall Street um, as a place to learn what business was, to understand the financial aspect of it. Uh, still think that way. I know we're talking about left and right brains, and I still run a marketing decision through a PL at the same time. So um, that was super formational for me. Uh, and then I actually had a moment when I was an investor at Apex and investing in all these incredible consumer brands. Uh, and we were we were doing a pipe into PBH to buy Calvin Klein. And I looked at the other a pipe the being, would you mind describing oh, that uh, for the sure. listeners? Uh, gosh, it's a private investment into a public entity. I think I got the, the lingo right. Um, and I sat on the side of the table and I thought, I think I'm on the wrong side of the table. I, I wanted to be there after the transaction. I wanted to be in the room when they talked about design. I wanted to be in the room when they talked about the brand and went and executed on everything. And that was a big light bulb moment for me. And set me really on the path that I'm on now. And I went back to business school, wrote a little essay about how I wanted to run a beauty brand one day. Um, we can talk about why beauty and, and kind of the passion that I have for our industry. And I've been, you know, working through that ever since. Uh, and, you know, have worked at 
what I think are some of the most incredible brands um, in the industry. Uh, now, now I'm building what I hope will, will stand the test of time in the way that those have, uh, but loved every step of it. Um, and I think a lot of my thinking comes from the multi-dimensional aspect of my background. Um, I think about problems from a lot of different angles and think about our strategy and where we're going. So and something the, that I really enjoy. And, and this year there have been, you know, there haven't been too many problems to think about, right? <laughs> so pivot is the is the is the word of 2020. Um, and and we'll probably can continue to be. But um yeah, it's it's been a wild year. Um, we're super fortunate. I feel so grateful that our business has continued to grow, has continued to thrive. Our team is doing an incredible job. The sun's still out, which um, is is great news for us. People still need sunscreen, um, but we've certainly changed a lot how we communicate, um, what our messages are, the tools that we're using for that, and I think that's that's only going to continue. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're very much this is all about being on your toes, um, and and not knowing what tomorrow brings. So so let's talk about tomorrow a little later on. Um, bring us back a bit, maybe, to the origin story of the brand and to tell us um, how it was conceived and how sort of led with SPF was something that, that uh, came to be. Yeah, we have a wonderful founder. Her name is Holly Thaggard, uh, and she... Back in 2005, had a had a friend who was diagnosed with skin cancer at age 29, and and that was a moment that that changed her life, has consequently changed my life, and will change a lot of lives. Uh, in which she sort of tried to understand, well, why is it that somebody who's so young is getting skin cancer? Um, and she learned that it was incidental sun exposure every single day, walking to the car, to the office, to the playground, whatever you're doing. Um, that over time um, was, was causing um, a cancer that one in five people um, will actually experience in their lifetime. So it's a pretty shocking number. Um, and she's set her life, her life's work is to change the way the world thinks about sunscreen so that all of us wear it every single day. And then we watch one in five, go to one in 10, go to one in 15 and, and beyond. Um, and everything that we do at Supergroup is about that. Um, there's something beautiful about leading an organization that has such a clear sense of self, such a clear mission. Uh, and whether it's product or marketing or channel strategy, it all goes back to that. But it really, it's a like all great entrepreneurial stories. It started with a problem. Um, and, you know, how do you solve that problem? You create SPF that everyone wants to wear. And have you done um, studies on change management about how does one get uh, a group, a population to think about SPF the way, for example, they think about brushing their teeth, uh, doing it at least twice a day. Um, that's obviously something that that you believe in. And uh, how do you incorporate that kind of belief system and, and messaging into um, getting a consumer to act differently? And and by the way, you know, there's been sunscreen around forever, but you have really tripled down on that message and um, presumably are really desirous of people not just putting it on when they go on holiday. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. And, you know, we, we say we treat a serious subject with a smile. And I think if you go back to the beginning of this brand, the product, the messaging, the name, the exclamation point, the use of yellow, it's all to, you know, we, we really believe that you can't change behavior by scolding people or scaring people, which often was the, the tactic um, when you think about sort of ending a disease, right? Uh, you, but you have to actually woo them into it. Um, so that that impacts how we think about product development, right? We want to create product that people enjoy using. Uh, before this brand, people usually heard the word sunscreen, and, and they still do. We still have a lot of work to do and think, oh, it's this sticky, tacky mess that I put up with at the beach. Uh, so if you create beautiful product that I actually want to wear, that changes behavior. Uh, also, how you market, where you show up, the, the spirit of the brand, I think, is really important. Um, you know, there's a lot of science and a lot of technology that goes into what we do, but we don't we don't talk about skin cancer um, all that much. We talk about it probably in the, in the month of May, which is uh, Melanoma Awareness Month. But for the most part, we talk about the joy and the health and wellness aspects of what we're doing. Yeah, but so you just said the word sticky tacky. So I was going to ask you what was missing. So do you believe that before? Um, super goop. Uh, all the brands out there were just uncomfortable. Uh, they they prioritize SPF, but not comfort and 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 maybe the the touch or the hand. Maybe maybe there are a few other things. But can you describe what was yeah. missing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, SPF was really is was really a seasonal business, mass market business 
uh, that was, was really about function over, you know, just did, did I get a sunburn or not? Um, but didn't really think about the actual aspect of applying the product and the desirability of that. Uh, I think it also, you know, another big change that we have been literally the, the first brand to do this was to create something that was clean. So if, you, if you're going to use this every single day, it was very important to Holly at the beginning and to us, you know, on a daily basis now to ensure that it was, it was safe, um, that there were no controversial ingredients. Um, and, and we were really clean before it was cool to be clean because the purpose demanded it. Yeah. Uh, so those are probably two of the biggest things, but there also was never a brand that was about lifestyle. Um, it was really, again, it was just, it was something that you did because you had to, not because you wanted to. Um, and back to like, how do you change behavior? Um, it's much more powerful to do it um, out of desire and joy. So you, you're a, um, we had a, a giggle about this before we started sort of people ask you, um, are you a left brain person or your right brain person? Because they are, you're an enigma because of your background being a financial and be a marketer. Um, how do you feel that as now the president of a company, that background in one person um, has been helpful uh, or maybe at times frustrating or, you know, any, any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's the only way I know to how to be. <laughs> so we'll go with how it's helpful. Uh, you know, I, I think it's because at the end of the day, it's it's my job to tie all the pieces of the puzzle together. And I think that there are pieces of the puzzle that that are part of this brand that are super creative, um, that are very visual, that are super emotional. Uh, you know, whether that's a, you know, marketing campaign or the visual or the packaging design or something like that. And there's super, there's things that are really logic based. Um, how do you run a P and L? How do you make sure that you have good ROI on what you're doing? Uh, you know, how do you make sure the product shows up on time? Uh, you know, all these things. And, and I don't think one works without the other. And I think when you're sitting in my shoes to understand and also to really respect the importance of both, I think that I really believe that, that it takes both to have a lot of success that, that, that one side without the other just doesn't work. So I think it's actually to me that the ultimate way to get to be sort of sitting at the intersection of, of all the pieces of the puzzle, it's really, you know, I have people on the team who are 10 times, a million times better at their, at their work than I ever would be. Um, but where I can add value is saying, well, well, how does it all fit together into one, one piece? So with your, uh, your, prior, let's say, investor hat on, and when you look at the, the wider beauty industry, um, and, and maybe just the prestige industry going out of beauty as well into fashion, maybe the fashion industry may be even more of a culprit in this, um, but also you know, people increasingly overvaluing the, let's call it, uh, right side of the brain, the creative marketing side of the brain, and with, without um, really the, the proper understanding nor caring to understand about, let's call it the business side of the brain. Um, have you uh, any opinions on, um, on, on what you see across the industry? Forgetting not, not your company, I'm talking about just the industry in general. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there has been a shift. I think there'll be an ongoing shift, which I, where I see, you know, the logic and the numbers becoming more and more important in beauty. I think that, you know, when I started in the industry, I, I think I've seen a big evolution in that. Um, and and I, I graduated from business school and I got into the beauty industry and people thought I was totally nuts. <laughs> yeah. um, whether they were my friends or people who I was interviewing with who were also like, why are you here? Um, and I don't really <laughs> totally get what you have to add to the equation. Um, and so, you know, I'll be forever grateful for my, my, my first break because there wasn't necessarily the same value placed on somebody who could could do the number side of things as well. I think I think the world has changed. I think as the industry has gotten much more competitive, I think the demands on it as it's gotten much more digital. I think like you you have more information to make good decisions based on in a way that quite frankly you didn't um, probably five or ten years ago. So I think the demands for that logic side of the brain have become increased. Mm -hmm. I also think we're in an interesting moment in which, you know, profitability is like all of a sudden chic again. So oh, imagine um, that. Yeah. <laughs> imagine that. And I've been banging that drum for a while. Uh, and so I think that this sort of, you know, I, I look at everything as how do we create something that's going to be a billion dollar global brand that's going to last a hundred years. And I think if, if you're thinking that way, you need more than just the creative. Amen to that. So moving away from background and going into sort of the, the making of the sausage, as it were, can you talk a little bit about 
the distribution sort of mechanisms you have in place here. I know that you are growing obviously a lot digitally, uh, but also I think in the Far East as well. Maybe you sort of set the table as to where you are today as a business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a what I would would hope to characterize as sort of a future of beauty distribution. So, um, you know, Sephora has always been a really important partner of ours. Um, They're incredible at helping build brands of of putting you on the map, of giving you incredible visibility, incredible credibility. Holly was was early into there uh, before, you know, before the brand is even where it was. But when when I joined, we had one shelf and a hundred Sephora stores. And that meant a lot to me in, in sort of making the decision to come here because I know how powerful they are in the industry. Um, and we've really supplemented that with, you know, broader retail distribution. So um, we're in places like Nordstrom, we're in Anthropology, we're in Urban Outfitters, we're in, in kind of this opportunity to showcase our brand to a lot of different types of people. Because I think something unique about Supercoop is that we can appeal, you know, you, you said your, your family is, is a user of this brand, right? It's a whole different, um, you know, consumer base and might shop in certain retail channels that are typical for beauty. Uh, we also have a very strong DTC business, which was really built from scratch over the last three, four years. Um, and we are expanding rapidly internationally. Um, we're really thinking about, you know, again, I said, our mission is to change the way the world thinks about something. <laughs> I mean that seriously. So if you do that, you know, and, and we really started in Asia because that we felt like if we could have our brand translate there, which is truly a market that understands SPF much more intimately, uh, has a huge and high expectations around the quality of product, that if we could be successful there, that that was just a huge proof point for us. And, and we've been sort of blown away and, and just humbled by, mm-hmm. by the opportunity that the, that is presented to us. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. One of the things that's, that's I think, often uh, lost in beauty is it's not just about the, the goop, as it were, in your, in your case. Um, it's also about the delivery mechanism. And I've often found that you guys uh, have always put a lot of thought into how you get at the cream, the sunscreen. Um, and and so talk a little bit about sort of the way you try and sit people around a table to dream up new products and new delivery mechanisms and new ways of thinking about, you know, where else are we going to get people to put sunscreen and, and how it's going to be uh, delivered there conveniently? How are they going to carry it around conveniently? How is it going to be on a big pump for, so the kids can all put it on easily? How do, how do you sort of push product innovation? Yeah, you know, and I have to say this is this is the place where, you know, Holly is is the person who would tell you she dreams about SPF and she literally means it because I've gotten the calls in the morning. Guess what? Uh, but you know, all of us certainly contribute to that journey. And I think that the the mission of the business is the guiding light, right? If you're saying, How do I get somebody to do this every day? Uh, that that it that's the problem to be solved. And then the product is a solution to that problem. The, the product is our purpose. And so Something like, for example, um, one of the stories that I love is that our tubes for our play sunscreen are flat. Most of our tubes are flat. And that is so that they fit into the back pocket of somebody's you know, jeans or their, you know, whatever they're wearing, you know, easily into a backpack or something like that, that just makes that portability. So the answer is like, don't ever tell me you don't have it with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and everything is often going to like, give me a reason why you're not wearing SPF. And then we're going to create a product that answers that question. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is coming from sort of places that we'll dream to go that people maybe didn't even think that the world could go yet. So we launched um, a shimmer shade eyeshadow uh, about a year and a half ago uh, that was an answer to the question of five to 10% of uh, skin cancer comes on the eyelid. Okay, well, how am I going to get somebody to put sunscreen on their eyelid? Yeah. Well, you know, you talk to a woman and well, what does she do every day? She's putting, you know, eyeshadow on. So it's, it comes really from a problem solution type of in the last, what has it been, nine months we've been living in this crazy pandemic world, 
there's I think there've been two um, themes that keep on popping up in in the wider consumer industry. One is skincare, and the second is outdoor lifestyle. And those two crosshairs you know, come into focus squarely uh, over your business. Um, do you have any anecdotes or interesting stories that come from you seeing upticks in the business? Uh, skincare, we know, obviously, but outdoor living and people sort of now having to spend a lot more time outdoors and uh, even having lunch with friends, I guess, uh, in parts of the country. Have you seen, have you actually felt that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would say is I think that we're, we are in a very fortunate position in which our product is still in demand and our brand is still relevant. Uh, you know, and I think that I also feel very lucky that we didn't get some sort of bump that gets taken away, right? The one time thing, shift of behavior. And, and now I kind of go back to where I was before. I've sort of done that and now I'm moving on. Um, I do think we're all much more aware about, um, you know, the product that we're putting on our, um, on our skin, how we're treating our health and wellness, the amount of time we're spending outside. But I, I think that, you know, we had to work really hard to be in that conversation. And, and it was an interesting moment in, it was probably around, you know, June or something where, where I had somebody call me and they said, Oh, your business must be a mess. Uh, because the rest of the sun care category had really suffered because it was so associated with the beach and going on spring break. And like those things obviously didn't happen in the way that uh, many of us had, had hoped for this year. Um, but we had already sort of moved on and, and talked about blue light and, you know, if you're sitting in front of a window all day, why you need sunscreen and the fact that you were taking your morning run. So I think some of it is about, just retelling your story in a way that's relevant. I think that's, I think that's what makes great brands is that they can flex and, and sort of bend to wherever the mm -hmm. consumer mindset is. And that certainly has been one that's benefited. Us. And speaking of the consumer mindset, obviously sustainability uh, is on everyone's uh, tongues. Um, I heard for the first time, actually, this expression, a uh, blue, blue beauty, um, which was uh, with the oceans at the forefront of the concern. Um, how do you think about the oceans and other sustainable uh, initiatives when you do develop those products? Yeah. So when I, when we think, you know, sustainability is really important to us. It's a, it's a huge passion point. And I think there's, there's probably three things that we think about. One is the goop that goes in the tube, right? The decisions that you make about the formulas that you use. Um, we were very early to be reef safe. So we were the first product out there to be oxybenzone free. And then when the regulations came out in Hawaii, we took every single formula and pulled out octanoxate. That is not a, <laughs> that is not a small feat or a small investment. Mm -hmm. We had the reason we were able to do it successfully without sacrificing efficacy, without, you know, changing the formula feeling to consumers was because we had been working on it long before that it would be, you know, became a, you know, a law. So we were way ahead of that. The second thing is really packaging decisions. This is where I think the beauty industry still has a lot of opportunity um, in terms of, you know, how do you, you know, a lot of this stuff is single use. So we're, you know, we, we changed all of our cartons to be recycled, right? That was sort of, an, but like, we haven't figured out tubes yet. It's a huge piece of work that we're working on. We, we hope to. Sunscreen makes life a little bit harder because it eats away at tubes and you kind of can't use everything that, so that's still a work in progress. And then there's everything else that you do in your business. And I think sometimes you can make so many small decisions. So we took out all of the inner shippers out of everything that we were shipping around to all of our retailers. Um, and we just dawned on us, it was our head of ops who said, you know, gosh, we're putting all these dividers between every um, carton to protect them as they're, as they're, you know, going through the mail. Like, I think we could get away without doing that. And mm -hmm. three a week later, boom, gone. So I think there's a lot of stuff that, that we try and find the, you know, anything that we can do and, and have that in, in mind as we're making every single decision. So when you are doing these things, whether it's, you know, dealing with technology to re-engineer um, products uh, or technology in general um, to enhance the experience uh, of the consumer through digital. Um, how how do you think of technology uh, as it plays into the industry at large? Uh, and yes, beauty specifically, even down to maybe customization of products, potentially individualized products one day. Um, what's your take on the tech revolution within the consumer industry? I'm personally really interested in it. And I think it's, I think there's, there's so many, again, there's probably a lot of different aspects of it. I think uh, one of the most 
impactful ways is just how do people consume product? How do they find your product? Um, and how do they figure out which one's right for them? I think that's probably the, and then how do they get it delivered to them, right? I think all of those, that that sort of experience around product, I think has been really interesting. Um, I think we're seeing that whether it's in media, whether it's in the retail experience, the delivery experience, uh, I think all those things are super relevant. Uh, I think it's impacting, you know, to your point, you know, how much customization can you get into? I think there's, you know, a huge amount of opportunity there. And one thing that I'm personally really interested in for our business is how does technology help create habits, right? Like we're, we're interested in, um, you know, creating a healthy habit, right? And getting you to do something every single day. So, you know, I'm not sure, you know, exactly how that's going to shake out, but it's something that I'm personally interested in is it's kind of how do how does technology impact daily use of product? Um, so we're obviously in that kind of category. And, and you know, speaking of habit, maybe think of subscription. Um, mm-hmm. We had we had a whole discussion here earlier today about the um, subscription button on Amazon and other subscription um, abilities that one can find elsewhere in the industry. Um, from a, a lifetime value perspective, have you guys sort of zeroed in on those? kinds of uh, opportunities to just have people keep on having it be sent to them forever. Um, is that a, is that actually a real opportunity? Is it, is it small and a distraction or what's your take on sort of the subscription button? Yeah, I think it's real. We, we launched something called super mail, um, back in February, ironically enough, um, you know, before the world, uh, changed on us, but you know, I think, again, I think we all, we went, the reason we did it was because the always said, well, does this, is this relevant to our mission? The answer is yes. Um, and that's always sort of what we go back to. Uh, it's not a huge portion of our, you know, it's different than being a subscription based business. Uh, but I think it's something that we're, we're interested in kind of where the opportunity can lie. Uh, because I think it, it certainly is something that we see as a loyalty driver and again, a habit driver, uh, I think we're probably in the 1.0 version of it though right now. So as we round the the horn here uh, and get close to the end, could you, let's, let's talk about some futures stuff here. Um, what's, what's coming down the pike for you? What are you excited about for Supergoop that, that you feel is going to be either uh, imminent or, or, or the hopes and dreams for the company? Gosh, I have so many. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, look, I think, I think one thing that um, makes me so excited about this business is that this consistent experience that I have where people say, Oh, I know that brand. I love that brand. Like we, we just have such an extraordinary product and mission and spirit that I think everyone that we're able to bring into the super group family um, really falls in love, changes behavior is, is healthier for it. Uh, and I think that's an amazing feeling, but for every one of those people, um, we, we just, you know, did a little bit of our first round of consumer research and, oh my gosh, we barely scratched the surface. Yeah. Um, there's so much opportunity and, and I've always believed in that's like what makes things, what's kept us going through this period of time. That's what's going to keep us going and go, we're going into 2021, you know, no holds barred saying like, we can, we can get this, we can, we can go after this. We have the right, um, you know, the right products and the right brand to kind of continue to grow and it's very right. So we're super excited. I'm personally really excited. Um, but I think we're, I, I, the other thing that I'm really curious about from a broader point of view is I've watched a lot of change happen in marketing tools. And, you know, I, I started in this industry in the land of department stores and print magazines and co-op and, and then I watched this, you know, and, and participated in this revolution and, you know, launched Dior onto e-commerce and started its Facebook page and talking about CRM and influencers before, you know, influencers was even a word. Uh, and, and I remember those early days and I remember feeling this shift. Um, and I, I feel like we're seeing a shift now again. And I don't, I don't you know, and, and, and people have been asking for a couple of years now, like, well, what's, you know, what's next in marketing? And I've always been like, yeah, I think, I think we're good. Same thing. Um, I think that we're going to sit here in a year or two from now and the whole list of things that make a marketing engine work is going to have changed. Um, some will stay um, what they are now, but I think there's a whole new world out there that I'm really excited about of like, what, what's that next toolkit going to look like. And I think it's brought on by, you know, sort of Gen Z's coming of age, a whole, this whole you know, year that we've lived through, how people's habits are changing. Um, and I think we're on the cusp of something else. Uh, 
I don't know everything about what it is yet, but that gets me really excited too. Oh, we'll have to do this again in a, in a year. We'll, we'll do this again in a year and see. Um, so I've been speaking to a lot of brands recently about their sort of looking into next year. As at this recording, it is December 2020, and we're staring down the barrel of uh, a few more months of quite sort of horrific um, spread of this this pandemic. Uh, but also with vaccines and, and an end in sight, um, there's a lot of positivity uh, actually that I'm seeing from the business community around the second half of next year uh, so from the, the big guys, the incumbent beauty companies and, and other uh, companies across consumer as well. Uh, you once told me that you had an advisor from one of your private equity firms who talked about the roaring 20s starting <laughs> in 2022. Um, are there any... Um, sort of lights of optimism, things you want to share that um, give you some uh, encouragement around this subject, specifically uh, pandemic related? I mean, goodness, I, I'm not a, um, you know, a scientist or, you know, a, a prediction expert. Um, but I, I think what you're hearing in all of that is the resiliency of the human spirit. Um, and I think especially if you're a leader, um, it's the only way to be. Uh, you know, you have to think that way. You have to say that, and, and it's not just say, but believe at the most fundamental way that, that we are going to get out of this um, and we're going to be better for it. Um, and that, that is where I have my mind. Um, and I certainly believe it. And what, are, what are the, what's the journey between here and there? Who knows? Uh, but I think, I think it's the only way to think. I think it's, I think it's important um, to believe in that. Well, I think that's a, as good enough a place as any to uh, to end. Uh, I'll also remind everyone that Amanda Baldwin here today said that profitability is chic, and you, you heard it here, and uh, let's hope it happens everywhere. And uh, Amanda Baldwin from Supergoop, thank you so much for doing the safari. Thanks for having me. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.